Hi. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, I'm a, a PhD student at Purdue University in my final year. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Hartmut Neven from Google, um, as well as uh, my Purdue colleague Nanding and uh, my Purdue advisor Vishy Vishwanathan. So first I'll uh, give some background uh, about adiabatic quantum optimization. Uh, so uh, AQO is uh, one of the uh, quantum computing models with uh, the best prospects for scalable hardware implementation. Um, there have been some encouraging results uh, about uh, its computational uh, uh, power. And there is actually a, a company called D-Wave Systems that's developing a hardware implementation of uh, this quantum computing model. Uh, there have been some questions from the academic community over the years whether the hardware that D-Wave uh, manufactures is really quantum. And there is a very nice uh, Nature article uh, from last year that uh, studied uh, the quantumness of uh, the D-Wave devices. Um, D-Wave also had a successful collaboration with Google a couple of years ago. Uh, we were able to train a large-scale car detector using uh, one of their previous chips. Um, also, a machine uh, was purchased by Lockheed Martin and a quantum computing center was established at the uh, University of Southern California last year. Uh, for machine learning purposes, the DWAVE hardware can be regarded simply as a discrete optimization engine that uh, accepts quadratic un unconstrained binary optimization problems. This is an image of uh, the DWAVE machine that was purchased uh, last year. And here I have a little video to illustrate uh, the adiabatic algorithm and how it achieves uh, optimization tasks. So um, the algorithm goes as follows. Uh, first, uh, we start the system uh, into something that's called the, in the initial Hamiltonian or beginning Hamiltonian, which is uh, usually an energy landscape uh, with a very simple structure and easily preparable ground state. Uh, and then we gradually turn the knobs of the system to deform the Hamiltonian uh, into uh, the problem Hamiltonian, which is um, an energy landscape that def uh, defines the uh, um, problem that we're trying to solve. So uh, there is a theorem from physics called the adiabatic theorem that says that if we do this process slowly enough from beginning Hamiltonian to problem Hamiltonian and we have started the system into the ground state of the beginning, beginning Hamiltonian, then at the end we're going to have stayed uh, in the ground state uh, of the system, so we're going to be in the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian, which is the solution to our optimization problem also, and then we just need to read out the, the state of the system and we have the solution to the uh, problem that we're solving. So here is how this goes. We initialize the system into the beginning Hamiltonian in the ground state, and then we start to gradually deform the, uh, the Hamiltonian into the problem Hamiltonian, but classically we might get stuck in a local minimum. However, due to quantum effects, we might actually be able to tunnel through a barrier <laughs> and still find the, the, the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. Okay? So this is the quantum magic. <laughs> All right. So here are some images of the D-Wave processor. So they're uh, built on a superconducting technology. Um, there have been several generations completed already, from all the way from 4 to 512 qubits. And that means, the, the latest generation means that we can solve uh, problems with 512 binary variables, okay? Uh, they implement in hardware the icing model, also equivalent to quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, weighted max 2 sat, all of these. So whatever we do uh, in machine learning, we have to uh, transform our problems uh, into uh, this form in order to be able to uh, use the quantum hardware. Uh, here's another video to illustrate the operation of uh, the D-Wave hardware in particular. Uh, so these uh, lollipop-looking uh, things uh, are supposed to be the qubits, and uh, the sticks pointing up or down, uh, they um, signify the state of, of, of each of these qubits. So up is like spin up or spin down, right, you know, uh, zero or one. Um, at each of the qubits, we have uh, individual biases, positive or negative, uh, illustrated by the blue and red arrows, and uh, pairs of qubits have uh, couplings between them. So those are the quadratic terms of the icing model. Um, 
Okay, so first uh, we start the system into the beginning Hamiltonian, which is basically a magnetic uh, transverse magnetic field that uh, uh, puts all the qubits in a superposition in their computational basis. And then we gradually turn off the magnetic field and turn on the uh, couplings and biases that define the problem Hamiltonian. And then at the end of the quantum evolution, if ev everything has gone well, if we, if we have stayed in the ground state of the system, uh, the final state of the qubits uh, is supposed to encode the, the solution to our optimization problem defined by the um, couplings and biases of the icing model. Okay. Um, now uh, to machine learning. Um, in machine learning, uh, the problem that we're uh, uh, trying to solve here uh, is uh, supervised learning in the presence of label noise. So uh, usually the way uh, data is uh, labeled is, right, you know, we have all kinds of uh, in ways of uh, introducing label noise in the data. Um, and this might be a practical problem, um, especially when uh, convex losses are used to um, uh, train uh, classifiers. Uh, so there has been some work in the uh, past couple of years that has studied uh, convex losses under label noise. And they have shown that um, actually they um, cannot be made robust to the label noise um, that might be pre present in the data in practical situations. So that's why um, here we try to uh, take advantage of the quantum hardware on a non-convex loss function, which would allow us to be robust to uh, the label noise in, in practical data sets. So here's a simple example to illustrate the failure of um, convex losses. So uh, here we had a, pro a problem from uh, a Google data set of OCR in photos. Uh, each of these figures here uh, is about a, a particular training problem, uh, uh, a digit classification. So th this could be, let's say, the digit zero versus uh, the rest, uh, one versus the rest, two versus the rest, and so on. Um, Usually what we want to see when we train a binary classifier is that as we uh, optimize uh, the objective function better and better, this is from left to right here on the x-axis, the training error should be going down, right? And this is what happens in, in some of these training problems when using a convex function. Uh, but in others, uh, the training error might be going down up to some point and then starts going up, or it would, would be like going up um, all the way as we optimize better and better. And this is completely a broken training problem. We, we don't want to do this. And the reason why this happens is that um, the label noise in the data creates large negative margins that get severely penalized by a convex loss function because the convex loss function has unboundedly growing penalties for such large negative margins. And what happens is that the uh, noisy data points are pulling the decision hyperplane towards themselves so that the total empirical risk is minimized. Um, and uh, yes, that uh, creates a solution that, that is not actually the, the best decision hyperplane that we might be looking for. So, so this is uh, how convex losses fail on uh, noisy uh, data. There has been prior work on uh, robustness with non-convex losses. Uh, the difference between uh, these papers and our work is that uh, they have all uh, resorted to convex optimization um, to solve the non-convex problems. And uh, it's easy to see that this is not the right way to do it uh, because the convex optimi optimization methods would just get stuck in a local minimum and would have no uh, mechanism of escaping it. Whereas here, we are actually trying to solve the non-convex problem with uh, non-convex optimization. Okay, uh, some basic definitions here of what we're doing. So again, we're training a binary classifier of this form. Uh, the, we have a feature vector x, and the parameters that we're optimizing are a weight vector w uh, and a bias b. Um, so the training is accomplished by L2 regularized risk minimization of this form. Uh, the empirical risk is an average um, of uh, loss contributions from each training example. Um, and the loss function is a function of uh, what is known as the margin, which is basically the distance um, from a certain data point to the decision hyperplane defined by W and B. Um, the loss functions, we have a lot of choices for loss functions. The most natural one is 0-1 loss, but this is known to be, of course, it's non-convex and would be robust to label noise, but it's also known to be NP-hard. Uh, square loss, on the other hand, is convex. It's, it's an example of a convex relaxation um, or a surrogate loss. 
uh, that can be used in training, but it's non-robust because of its uh, convexity. Um, the loss function that here uh, we uh, propose, uh, we call it Q-loss, and it looks uh, uh, like this. So the intuition behind it is that we achieve robustness by cutting off the penalty for uh, large negative margins, okay? And the cutoff is controlled by a hyperparameter Q. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and that hyperparameter would be uh, cross-validated um, in actual training problems. So, uh, the, the initial formulation of Q-loss looks like this, but uh, this is not immediately a cubo in cubo form, so we can't uh, put it on the quantum hardware. So, so we need to do something uh, additional in order to make it compatible with quantum optimization. Uh, we achieve this uh, via variational approximation. Um, so uh, we notice that the Q loss can be uh, upper bounded by uh, a family of parabolas. Um, so the goal of the variational approximation is to express the loss in terms of uh, uh, these upper bounding uh, parabolas. So the key to the variational approximation is to transform uh, into a new coordinate system where the loss is uh, concave. Uh, and here, this is this transformation. Uh, the upper bounding parabolas become uh, tangent lines, and once we have that, we can apply convex duality uh, to express uh, the, uh, this function here in terms of the tangent lines. Then we transform back into the original space, and we get our formulation in terms of uh, the upper bounding parabolas, which is this one here. So this, is, uh, a, a, this now is a, a cubo, and uh, we are compatible with quantum hardware. Um, the only drawback is that uh, we introduce uh, a variational parameter t here for each training example. Um, also can be viewed as a latent variable. Um, so for each data point participating in the uh, empirical risk, we would have a, a latent variable like that. And then the total number of qubits that we're going to need um, uh, is going to depend also on the size of the training set uh, as well as the number of features. Um, but uh, this variational parameter t at each data point gives us a nice uh, intuition to uh, how robustness is achieved. Um, basically, with the variational parameter, uh, we can uh, implicitly uh, flip the label of a possibly mislabeled data point uh, whenever it's incurring a large negative margin. Um, also, it can be easily seen that a block coordinate descent method uh, may be applied. Uh, in this situation, if we decompose into model parameters and latent variables, and we tried this, but uh, we're, we're quickly getting stuck in bad local minima. So uh, this was another indication that this is a hard problem uh, that may really benefit from being solved by quantum optimization. Um, also, I mentioned we have this hyperparameter Q, uh, <coughs> which uh, uh, creates a trade-off between robustness and computational hardness. So if we take Q to be approaching negative infinity, of course, the loss would become effectively convex. So this would be an easy uh, optimization problem, but not robust to label noise. Uh, then if we move Q closer to zero, uh, we're getting closer and closer to something like zero one loss, which uh, becomes MP hard. So in reality, we would have to do a cross validation over different values of Q and, and see uh, in practice, what gives, uh, which uh, value uh, gives the best trade-off between robustness and hardness. Um, so for that purpose, we uh, computed a bound um, uh, on Q in order to get an interval, a tight interval to choose um, uh, uh, cross-validation values from. Um, so and there we have a simple argument for, for this, uh, basically for um, the empirical risk of, for any given data set, we want it to be uh, at least um, uh, this quantity, uh, which would be the, obje the um, objective value uh, when all of the mislabeled data points are, uh, are at the uh, constant segment of the loss on the negative side. So that means that all of them are being indicated as mislabeled by the loss. Um, but the empirical risk of the trivial solution of uh, all uh, zeros uh, is one. So then uh, we get this inequality here. We don't want this quantity to, to be greater than one because this is the objective value of the trivial solution. And then when we solve for Q, we get uh, this interval from which we can choose values um, for Q. 
uh, values of Q, Q outside of this interval, um, you know, just don't make sense. Okay. Um, uh, so also uh, to remind you, we're working here uh, in discrete optimizations space. So we uh, need to transform an originally continuous problem into a discrete problem. Uh, further, the d wave hardware doesn't have that many qubits uh, even now. Uh, so we need to be uh, frugal with uh, the uh, discretization of uh, uh, these continuous variables. Um, but in previous work, we uh, showed a bound that um, uh, indicates um, that it's not really necessary to use high precision in a binary expansion of uh, um, optimization variables. And also the experiments that we've done uh, so far support the usage of low precision variables. Uh, there's one other complication, though. Um, the interaction between empirical risk and regularization requires rescaling of model parameters. Um, and we uh, um, also uh, did a little calculation that showed that uh, if we set the weight variables in, in this interval, where lambda is the regularization strength, then the freedom of rescaling is guaranteed, and uh, we're all set in this case. So if, we can, if this interval is not too loose, and we can afford to have enough precision uh, inside it, then we're all set, we have our uh, discrete optimization problem. Um, okay. So the optimization strategy uh, that we use here is uh, um, just, uh, we use a tab taboo search, a classical heuristic as a stand-in for quantum hardware because uh, we uh, don't have the large quantum hardware that we uh, would need to use for uh, large-scale problems. Um, and the label noise model that we use uh, is a little different also from previous work. So previous work used um, uniform label noise injected in the uh, original data, and then uh, they were observing how the test error increases with increasing label noise. Here we used uh, asymmetric noise, so inserted only in the, one of the classes of the data. And here are our experimental results. We uh, used uh, six uh, data sets. Two of them are synthetic and are designed to um, bring out the deficiency of convex losses, and these, these four are um, UCI datasets. We compared with uh, a number of, of other methods, and uh, the experiments showed that actually our loss, uh, Q loss optimized uh, uh, with a discrete optimization method, uh, performed the best. It was the most robust with respect to increasing label noise. And also, there are indications that if we are able to run these experiments on the quantum hardware also, uh, we should get even better uh, robustness. So one final um, uh, figure that I want to show here is also a bonus that comes from the non-convex loss that can be also used to uh, give us information about which points in the training set were mislabeled. So we recorded the set of uh, flips that we injected in the training set before training. And after training, we looked at which of the margins resulting from the training are so negative that they fall on the constant segment of Q loss. Uh, and those are trained flips, we call them. So basically, the training process is, is telling us, hey, these points are probably mislabeled. <laughs> so then we wanted to see how these two sets overlap. Um, the orange color here shows full overlap. And that means all of the inje injected flips were also identified by training as, uh, as uh, wrong labels. Um, and the only non-perfect overlaps here we have for these two data sets, cover type and adult nine, and uh, the reason for that is those data sets have very high base error, and uh, probably the optimization problems there are much harder than in the other data sets, but applying the quantum hardware would probably give uh, better results there too. Thank you very much. <laughs>